Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast today. We're lucky enough to be joined by Don Poe, who is currently the CEO and president of People Productions. Um, he's been in the business for a while, and I understand from our chat before that there's been about a decade of sales enablement and operations experience that we're going to be sharing with the audience. Don, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me today. I'm excited to meet you. So the first question I'm going to ask is quite an interesting one. We've had a couple of guests come on and try to explain the difference or try to define both sales ops and sales enablement. But here, what would you say is the best definition you have for sales enablement? Well, I've been to a whole bunch of different events over the years, and I do take a holistic view of it. I think there's both a philosophy to what sales enablement is and a tactical execution for then what do you actually do in the field. And so on the philosophy side, um, you need to get marketing and sales working together. And that is part of sales enablement. But also part of sales enablement is in the buyer's journey, the, the sales funnel, making sure that your sales, that your customers have a continuous message from beginning to end. So your sales reps aren't saying something totally different from what your customers are finding when they're out on a website. Um, so that's kind of like the bigger picture philosophy of it. Uh, on the tactical side, you do need to empower your sales reps with um, everything they really need to have uh, and having really strong sales materials. Sure. And you know, so you mentioned you've been to a number of events, but I, I also understand you guys have some experience in this in this area? Where, where, where does that come from? How have you developed this expertise? Um, we, I, you know, I'm part of a company called People Productions, and we've been in business since the early 80s. And I've been here for over 25 years, and I am the CEO here. Um, back in 2008, when iPod touches were like the hottest new thing, one of our clients actually uh, distributed iPod touches to all their sales reps, and they were so excited. And we were making videos for them and they, we knew they were going to have some issues though, because they were just going to use the iPod uh, touch like iTunes music store to d distribute the content. And I, you weren't going to be able to measure anything. Uh, they weren't going to be able to get new content out to them. Uh, they couldn't get any analytics or anything about what was being done. So we actually started developing a platform and now there are a whole lot of platforms like this out there, but starting in 2009 and releasing it in 2010, uh, our platform ended up having like 10,000 uh, One of our customers had 10,000 sales reps on it. They were used it all around the world. We made our app work in 16 different languages. Uh, we had companies like Lockheed Martin on it, uh, Philip 66, Covidian, and Medtronic. Uh, those are big companies on it, but also a lot of smaller companies as well. And so we got to see through that process of how to onboard companies onto a platform. Uh, that would help distribute like PDFs and videos, sales apps, and uh, keep everyone really organized. You know, if you think of like how Dropbox or Box works, those are kind of like dumb front ends. Your sales reps can, well, you, the marketing team, could put stuff in there and your sales reps could pull stuff out, uh, but you don't know what's being used, if it's being used well. So our platform started dealing with all these analytics. It was really an uphill battle at the beginning because no one really knew what sales enablement was and what these platforms could really do. So it was a tough go at the beginning, kind of inventing the market, but we sponsored events and sales 2.0. And we now since then partnered with other platforms because where we started was originally a, a, a marketing agency. And we were moving into this, becoming a software platform creator, very much so. And it isn't what we wanted to do every day when we woke up. And we actually ended up starting to turn our platform off and partner with other pla uh, platforms that existed. We didn't want to be in the rat race of dealing with, is the server working and you know the latest iOS release of the thing. And we had the luxury. You know, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. I want to live somewhere where I want to live. I want to go home every day at a reasonable time. And while the platform was working really well, I wanted to get back into being the bookmaker, putting the content in the platform versus being the bookshelf, being the platform itself. So now we've partnered with uh, several different platforms over the years. And uh, so by running our own and by onboarding so many different customers, seeing what they did well, 
seeing what, what mistakes they've made. One of our clients didn't tag any of their assets. So they, while they had thousands of assets in the platform, they didn't tag them well. So it was kind of like you just put stuff in, but you couldn't find a thing. So we we have all sorts of uh, processes that we've developed to make it so that these platforms really start to sing. Got it. So just so I understand, we we built and grew the sale, well, what we could call an early sales enablement platform, um, onboarded some big customers, but then over time realized that that wasn't the core competency or that wasn't what you wanted to focus on as a business. And so then you transitioned kind of back out of that to the service business and then kind of sidelined the software business and now work with other platforms. And now you specialize in creating, and I really like the, the uh, definition you made between bookmaker and bookshelf. So now you guys are focused on getting really good at being the bookmaker and you distribute that through other people's bookshelves. Well, or you exactly. help clients distribute. Got it. Amazing. So that must mean, though, from that experience, you have, the, you have some understanding of how people can best utilize sales and open platforms. Could you share a couple of insights there? Well, when you first start using a platform like this, the, uh, you know, I, I have another analogy that I think about this, that when you've been moving around from place to place after college and you got this one couch when you're in college and you get this apartment and you get this other apartment and finally, maybe you're married now, you buy a house and you still have that one couch you've been dragging around with you from place to place and you move in and the couch is still comfy, but it still doesn't suit where you are. You need something different. And so that's kind of what I think about when people are really starting to upgrade their methodologies to using something like a sales enablement platform. And their content may have worked well in their old methodologies, just with like printing paper and having the sales reps keep it all on the trunk of their car or big binders or you know whatever people would do. But now that you're moving into your new, new house that you just all built, your old couch really kind of looks kind of ratty. And so we like to start with a content audit to uh, review kind of what materials does a company have. And we also interview the sales reps so that we understand kind of first person, what are the people in the field actually doing? Uh, we'd like to hear from those top tier reps. So through this process, we can align what marketing and sales are doing together and get them to have some consensus on their approach. Um, but also we look for those gaps in the sales funnel throughout the whole process. Again, using sales enablement as a philosophy, we want to make sure everything that's going on with the webinars and the email campaigns and you know, LinkedIn ads and you know, all those things all funnel, funneling all the way down to the, the reps uh, really are cohesive. And so when we, we look for the gaps in, in that issue. Um, so we then, now that we've taken a big look at this, we look at the content strategy. And this is like something any company can do on their own. This is like a best practice, I think, is going through these steps, you know, looking at what you have, talking to your team, seeing what's missing, starting to think about what new content is needed uh, for these kinds of platforms. You know, it's really interesting. Apps can work on there. There's things can be much more engaging and allow for the customer to be a part of the conversation versus just bragging about kind of what content you, you know, what you want to show the 60 page PowerPoint or something like that. Um, and so you get everything aligned on the messaging and uh, how do you tag things? How do you organize it in one of these platforms so that you can organize things by product line, but maybe you also organize it by say, for instance, uh, what area is your customer in? If you're talking to a surgeon versus a nurse, you might want to talk to them about different product benefits, different uh, approaches to sales and, and so on. So you can use this power of these platforms to make it so you can really start to onboard your reps in a much faster way because the platform serves the content in a manner that makes it so that your uh, sales reps can actually use it in a really fast, effective manner. And so we look for really interesting ways to bring the best out of these platforms, what can become more interactive and what can uh, uh, allow the sales rep to have a much deeper conversation than just kind of a surface bragging kind of conference. And I don't mean to talk bad about like kind of what the, some of those sales reps are doing. It's just, a, it's, these platforms really allow you to have a different approach. 
Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. There's one point you mentioned that I want to ask about, and it's always been like a massive challenge, both for sales ops, but also for sales leaders, is the relationship and the alignment between sales and marketing. Do you have any kind of best practices to help those two departments work together in harmony? <laughs> you know, before I talked about you know, interviewing the sales reps, but I think you, you know, during that content audit process and kind of when you're working with your teams, you actually go back to not just marketing and sales, but maybe you're even talking to like the product developers, the engineers, and what do they have interest in talking about what the product does. Now, engineering is going to approach all that in a very totally different way, but I think it really makes sense to have kind of these big workshops where everyone gets together and you do work to build consensus to see kind of what does each group bring to the table so that uh, everyone feels heard and that builds confidence in the process. You, when you're instituting a big sales enablement uh, platform or new cont approach like this, uh, you want to get people's buy into it so that there is actual uptake into it. And um, there are different people who approach this in different ways. For instance, you know, we do work with some companies that are have, have a lot of engineers on it. And they are always like, we need to make a video. We need to get the sell sheet. We need to get these things done. And we like to always take a strategic step back. And I think this is a take a, take a holistic view of all of those different pieces that go together that really impact your customer. Don't make a video just to make a video. Maybe you need a case study video versus a, a overview video or you need a testimonial versus like a how-to. You know, there's all these different kinds of pieces that can uh, work to uh, motivate your customer to kind of work their way through that uh, sales funnel through the buyer's journey. And so we really will look for building consensus through all those people and looking for cherry picking the best throughout all of them. So we understand really what the customer is really wanting to do and what will motivate them versus you, the company, just bragging about what you do, but maybe your customer doesn't even know about like the electrical power levels or the efficacy of like the, the way the thing works. And instead, you need to get to talking to them about what is really important to them, smoothness, speed, or you know, whatever that is. And so changing by talking to all these different people, you can understand a lot more about what the customer is looking for. All right, so for the, the sales ops and sales enablement people listening, there's obviously a vast array of different tools and applications they could use. Do you have a clear way of kind of breaking that down so the audience can understand what is available in terms of applications or tools within sales enablement? Yeah, there are, we do look for a lot of ways to bring new interactivity into those kinds of conversations. As again, before I was mentioning how like there's a 60 page PowerPoint that you know you could just show. But instead, there are a lot of interesting ways to make the conversation more uh, conversational. Um, for instance, we've done a lot of work with like 360 degree spinners. Right now, uh, COVID is going on right now. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done remotely. Uh, how do you do remote sales? How do you show your customer your product if you can't actually be there? And so we've, there are certain types of apps that can take either photos or a 3D model and spin it around in 360 so you can actually have hotspots and uh, bring up different salient messaging points that uh, matter to your customer. This can also work with AR sometimes. So you can actually do augmented reality and broadcast that uh, image into the room. But more often than not, I see that the AR tools don't have the ability to have hotspots. The AR functionality does have its place, but more often than not, it's, I think, of a little bit more of a gimmick, whereas like actually spinning the product and 
you know, maybe you can't spin it in every single way with this because that doesn't matter. You don't need to see the top of your product potentially. So why do you let it show that way? Instead of spinning it in very specific ways, you can uh, talk about what is uh, what you want the customer to know about. There's also ways to bring static PDFs uh, to life. Uh, sometimes with companies that have like really technological processes or complex products, you can uh, make that interactive so you can touch along and explain here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. And instead of having those just be just a video where you watch it or just a PowerPoint, uh, you can actually make it so hotspot. So you can actually make like interactive versions of your product for, for one of our clients, uh, they had a remote control for their hearing device and we actually made it so you could turn like features on and off with the uh, remote. Uh, but we then shot videos to show kind of like what would happen. How would it actually sound differently in different scenarios? So you can actually use uh, the interaction to have really interesting ways to talk about your product. And it really elevates the brand, your brand, uh, when you're having something that interesting. Another thing that every time I go to one of these events that's really, really interesting for people is an ROI calculator. And uh, I do understand it, but I'm always fascinated with like, in a way, they're not the most sexy things always, but there are ways to bring, to get a lot of information from your customer. And you have a really rich conversation with your customer at this point, getting into some real roots of their problems. And you learn a lot about them. And then by collecting this within the app, you can live uh, create a charts that uh, show like the ROI or the depends on all these questions. There's all sorts of different uh, algorithms you can use. Um, and you can actually generate a PDF within those apps and send it out. So your customer gets a copy of the PDF showing that, you know, maybe you're talking to your customer champion, the one who's really gunning for you. Uh, but then they can take that to their product uh the admins and the money people and show here's like how it will actually impact our company and have a cost benefit. Uh, those can actually then be sent to the sales rep and using these sales platforms. Um, a lot of these platforms can allow you to track uh, if things have been opened. So if, by sending something like this PDF, you can see that it got opened once, which is always nice. Or maybe you can see that it opened, uh, was opened up like 10 times. And that's really interesting. You've got a really hot lead there. And so by having these, uh, using these platforms in this kind of way, you can uh, get real insights into who your hot customers are. There's a totally different style of app than too called a playbook. And uh, playbooks are well known uh, and they can operate in different ways, but they can work like a decision tree kind of who is your target persona you're talking to? What are they interested in? Uh, and we've worked with those interviews with top, top sales reps to help guide the process in these playbooks so that you can customize what your best reps are doing. And as you onboard new reps, you can shorten the cycle for training uh, because the app itself actually helps suggest what direction should you go. One last kind of broad category, because there are so many, but in a broad sense, you can actually streamline your uh, sales process too by having like quote generators or quote books that uh, place the order in the field and they can operate with the API of like your ordering system. One of our clients, a couple of years ago, they were using uh, fax. They'd still place the order and then have to fax in the order via paper. And so by putting this in the actual app, there's a lot more tracking that can be done. It's a lot faster. It's a lot simpler, less you know, double entry of information and so on. So you can actually use apps to play, help with the order in the field. And on your iPad, you can actually sign on the dotted line right within the app. So those are some real broad, broad categories of some of these apps. I think I have the real masterclass, actually. Like we, we have never really talked about different types of sales collateral on this show. But there's the, the best example I really liked is, is that of the ROI calculator because to to actually – like make that valuable. You have to have, as you said, the detailed conversation with the client, which builds the bond. But you're also spitting out something they can use to sell it internally. Um, and so I think this was this was a really, really good conversation for the audience on this. Um, I, as I said before, I also liked your bookmaker and bookshelf analogy. And then the on the sales and marketing to try to get people aligned, to get everybody in the same room, understand what they each can bring, and then try and work out some kind of easy or some common ground in order to align the parties. Um, so 
I, I assume that you guys help create this kind of content. And so if people listening would like help with it, they, they would Google people, people productions, head to the site and can get in touch with you. We're the sales enablement agency of the year for 2019, according to a showpad, one of the sales platforms out there. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've people have definitely, definitely talked about showpad on the show. Awesome. Um, one final question, just so, I, I like asking every guest this. Is there somebody um, that you know in sales enablement that has that you think is a real like leading light in terms of in terms of thought leadership? Uh, I don't know how specific you want to be with this, but there's a guy named Vince at Medtronic that we've worked with many many times over the years, and uh, he is uh, a great philosopher for how this uh, can work and combining what everything that happens in the sales ops with sales enablement. And uh, he is the one that we had rich, originally invented our platform with back in 2009, and we still stay close touch with him. And he is um, a true visionary. We, as an agency, we work with a lot of different companies, and we find that the companies that really have people like him can help uh, do the, use the most of what we have. You know, some of the smaller firms we work with we might have to do like more of a one-off small project with because they don't have the engine to utilize everything that we can do. But if you have some people who are really have the vision for how to integrate all these different gears together, uh, things can really start to sing. So big props to Vince. Uh, I'm very, I, I love talking to him. Shout out to Vince. Um, Don, thank you so much for coming on and sharing that kind of masterclass on sales enablement and pre-sales content. I think it was super valuable. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you for your time and uh, good luck to everyone.